And um, I hope that, you know, all the songs have been sung. There's no more Christmas songs to sing. And all of the uh, stories have been read and the nativity stories have been read. Last night, Al read the Luke story of, of Jesus' birth. So we've celebrated the birth of Jesus. And in so doing, symbolically, we've celebrated the birth of ourselves, which is the child within. And we all are aware of that. We've gone through this. And um, I think everybody's made their point. You're celebrating the child within. You're celebrating the birth of Jesus. Whichever group you happen to belong to, that's fine. Uh, but the amazing part of this is that December 25th, which is, as you know today, is a birthday that is truly universal and for the most part ignored. December the 25th, and this is, um, if there's any spies here, you know, <laughs> this is kind of come as a shock, but December the 25th is not Jesus' birthday. I mean, I know, it's, it's, this is difficult to deal with, but that's a fact. And, you know, the point is, in the, the nativity story that we have made our own, we have created a, a myth for ourselves. Uh, that story is a myth that applied to many of the mythological gods predating Jesus by hundreds, thousands of years. Whether you want to call it Adonis or Tammuz or Attis or Osiris, and they, there was always a virgin um, given birth to a man god who wound up dying for everybody and then resurrecting. I mean, and that's uh, an age-old thing. And of course, we have made this uh, our own and said this is true for our particular hero, which in this case was Jesus. And then, of course, we gave him a name, um, which is a Greek name, and we gave a, a Jewish person a Greek name. So, you know, the whole thing, we've kind of uh, are created ourselves for our own special little story. And I guess it has served the purpose of, um, uh, of being a, a source of consolation to people. And if a myth becomes a source of consolation to people, that's fine. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. But actually, when we look at December the 25th, we have to understand that today is the literal birthday of the sun in the sky. And, and, and that's why all of the, of the gods of mythology are born on December the 25th because they all represent the sun, including Jesus, represents the sun. And um, how, do we talk, how do we talk outside of this building uh, to adult people to get people to understand this? Because even though this is provable astronomically, scientifically, this is a fact, you can't share it with anybody. People who, who, who even would say, well, this might be right, but I don't want to hear it. You know, and that's the sad that's a sad state of affairs because if you don't understand your own universe, if you don't understand you know, your own solar system, your own earth, how are you going to understand yourself? How are you going to understand you know, what purpose you're supposed to have in life and so forth and so on? But God's only son, the light of the world, is born today. And who knows that? I, I dare say there are very few people, and everybody goes to church today. By the literal millions of people going, flocking to churches all over the world. They were in churches last night. And I dare say very, very few, if any, knew or know that today is actually the birthday of the sun in the sky. So is today Jesus' birthday? The answer uh, is no, it is not. Today is the birthday of the sun. Or are they one and the same? Now you come up with something. The sun in the sky, Jesus, one and the same. And that would be the premise of this story this morning. And it's a magnificent story of the sun, the light of the world. And let's follow the cosmic clock and the clock of scripture and trace the life of the sun. So we can do that. And this is the sun in the sky whose birthday we celebrate today. And it starts back on page 583. If you have those little Bibles, and if you don't, uh, you know, see if, 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 if maybe you could see if, if everybody could get one of your feet up uh, nice and comfortable. Because it's good to see these things. And it, and only, it just takes a few minutes to look, and I give you the page numbers. Page 583, and in Isaiah chapter 7, we have the beginning of this 
what you would call celestial or biblical or spiritual or scriptural trajectory of the sun. Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Now I want you to see that. The Lord himself shall give you what? A sign. And this is very, very important. Now, uh, just for a moment, just digress. Go back to the first page of the Bible. Open the very first page of the Bible. Now, the Lord's going to give us a sign, all right? And look at um, verse 14. Genesis 1, verse 14. Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven. Those are the stars. And let them be for signs. So it says the Lord is going to give a sign. And the Bible says let the stars be for sign. The sun is a star. And here then we are understanding something because a virgin shall conceive, it says in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, the Lord shall give you a sign. A virgin shall conceive. Therefore, where should I look if I want to see the sun? I must look up into the stars. I must look up into the universe. And here we then see the beginning of this journey. In September, the journey begins when the sun is born out of the constellation Virgo. That's the beginning of it. The sun is born of a virgin in September, out of the constellation Virgo. Okay? The journey begins there. Now, the sun enters Libra, and Libra is the balance. And this is the point where we take up the cross. The balance must be reached between the physical and the spiritual. If our physical is high and our spiritual is low, we have no balance. If our spiritual is high and our physical is low, we have no balance. The beams of the cross actually symbolize that which is balance. And that is why the sun is moving towards the crucifixion and the crucifixion symbolizes that balance between the physical and the spiritual. Between October and November, prior to the sun being crucified in December, the sun moves through Libra and there's the balance which must be reached between, with your, between you and your crucifixion of yourself. It is a picture of Jesus balancing his own cross. Go to page 786 and look what it says in Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. And look what it says in verse 38. And he that does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. This is Libra. This is the law of balance. In other words, in order to follow, then the sun must pass through the cross. The sun must pass through that time of balance. And that's what we must do. We must be born out of a virgin mind, and we must enter that place of balance where we must give an equal amount of time. We must give equal consideration to the spiritual realm as to the physical realm, but we also must give equal understanding and concern to the physical realm as we do the spiritual realm and vice versa, okay? Now, the sun leaves Libra after that point of balance and enters Scorpio, okay? The sun enters Scorpio, and this here is an interesting thing. When da Vinci painted the Last Supper, Leonardo da Vinci was an astrologer, and he painted Judas as if you look at it and you count the numbers of the people in the picture of the Last Supper, if you count the person who is eighth from the right, you'll find Judas, who is represented as the eighth sign, which is Scorpio, the betrayer. Here, you know, as we go into the crucifixion part, you find Jesus is crucified between two thieves. And this is important, see, between Scorpio and Sagittarius, October 23rd to December 21st. Now, there is a harvest everywhere, every month of the year, somewhere, except these two months. These are the heavenly thieves, Scorpio and Sagittarius. And so there is where the crucifixion takes place, between Scorpio and Sagittarius, between the two thieves. Then the sun enters a constellation called Crux, which is the cross. That's December the 21st. December 21, the sun enters the constellation, the cross. It is the shortest day of the year. There is more darkness over the earth on this day 
because God's son is dead. Now let me show you something. In, let's take this out of the realm of the sky and put it into the realm of the mind. There is the Hindu philosophy, which is part of also Christian revelation philosophy, of what they call Kundalini. And that involves the seven chakras. And you raise yourself up to those six chakras, and then you hit that seventh chakra at the crown chakra, which throws open the right hemisphere of the brain, and then brings you to the point of new consciousness, which is symbolized by the number nine. Now look at this, when the sun is crucified, this is what I'm saying. December 21st, the sun goes through the cross in the heavens. Look at page 807. Here's a point where Jesus is crucified, and see what it says. Matthew chapter 27, and look at verse 45. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. So here then, you raise yourself up through that sixth chakra before that impacts at the seventh chakra, and then there is darkness over the land, there is darkness over you, there's a lack of understanding, there's a lack of enlightenment until you reach nine, which is that point of new mind, new consciousness. And so here then we see the sun, which is born of a virgin, which seeks the balance, which is betrayed by Scorpio, which then passes through the cross December 21st, is then crucified. Jesus then representing that sun is crucified and there's darkness all over the earth. There's an eclipse. The sun is crucified. Okay. All right. So from the sixth hour, there's darkness all over the earth until the ninth hour, you understand this. So the sun now is in the winter solstice. Once it leaves December the 21st, it rocks itself in December 22nd, 23rd, and 24th in the winter solstice. Three days and three nights in the tomb. Now Jesus is taken from the cross and laid in the tomb. And look at page 788 in Matthew chapter 12. Page 788. Now understand this. Look what we've traced so far. The sun, is sun in the sky is born of a virgin. The sun in the sky seeks the balance, which is the carrying of the cross. The sun in the sky is betrayed, which is Scorpio. The sun in the sky is crucified on December 21st, which is the, uh, you know, the shortest day of the year. The sun in the sky is entombed in the bowels of the earth in the winter solstice, three days and three nights. This is where we've gotten so far. And if you look at Matthew chapter 12 on page 788, and on verse 40, it says, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And that is an allegorical portrayal of the movement of the sun, three days and three nights in the bowels of the earth, is three days and three nights in the winter solstice. So here so far, what have we done? We have traced the very life of Jesus, Yahashua, whatever you want to call him, as being actually round by round, blow by blow, the movement of the sun out of, out of Virgo, through the balance of Libya, a Libra, the betrayal of Scorpio, the crucifixion of the crooks, the winter solstice of December 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. And now, the sun must prepare for resurrection. After the crucifixion of the flesh in your meditation, what must happen? See. And this is, is what's happening. It happens to Jesus in the story. It happens to the Son astronomically. It must happen to you. And this is the statement that Jesus was referring to when he says, you must be born again. There must be a birth out of the virgin. There must be a crucifixion. There must be a balance in your life. There must be Virgo, or there can be no child born within you. There must be Libra, or there can be no balance in your life between your spirit, spiritual and, and physical. There must be an understanding of Scorpio, that which will betray you from the flesh to that which is the spirit. There must be this crucifixion of the five senses. There must be entombment in this meditation. And if all of these things take place, just as it takes place in the sky, and I mean this is an astronomical, cosmological fact, if all of these things take place with inside of you, then you will be born again. And that's what Jesus says in John 3, 7. You must be born again, but you must die before you can be born again. And the sun cannot be born on December the 25th, which is today, Christmas Day. The sun cannot be born today unless it dies on December the 21st. See, all of this stuff was written in the stars thousands, millions of years before it was ever written in a Bible. So in order for the sun to be born, it first must come out of a virgin, it must be crucified, it must sit in the silence of the tomb, then it can be born. So death must come before life. 
And that's what this whole thing of you must be born again. There must be death to the old ways. And that's why when the, in the story Jesus looks at Nicodemus, he's looking at religion. And he says, there's no way. Look at, all of your, look at all of your Bibles. Look at all of your religions. Look at all of your doctrines. Look at all of your beliefs. There's no way you've got to give it. You've got to die from all of that stuff in order to be born again. You've got to give it all up. That's why we said last night, okay, a lot of people will judge church on the number of people that come to it, but this is a revolution. We're in a revolution. We are part of the revolution, and revolutionaries do not attract a whole lot of people. But I'll tell you something. I would rather positively change one person's life than negatively change 10,000. And what I have seen of the thousands or the millions who have subjected themselves into the religious circles is there's been a negativity. Violence and, 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 and fear. One of the things we said last night as we had this candlelight service, I said, you know, if nothing else if nothing else ever happened in this particular room, what can we say is wonderful? That we went through the whole year of 1994, and little children came into the, into the school back there, little school room, and little children came in here, and never once did a little child hear that they had guilt, that they had sin, that there was a devil, that there was demons, that there was hell, that it was all of this army. Never, never do we build in fear or guilt to children. And you know, if nothing else we've done, that's a celebration. The children have always come and heard about Jesus being gentle and caring and compassionate. They heard about dolphins and whales and the stars and the moon. They heard about the earth. They heard about things growing and health. They heard that they're special and that something is special within them. And if we've done nothing else, that is enough. That's the accomplishment. And so that's a beautiful thing. And so look where we are. The son is born of Virgo, it's born of a virgin. The son then must move through the balance, it must begin to understand the leverage between the spirit and the physical. The son must understand the betrayal of the flesh against it so that it moves into the crucifixion of the meditation. It sits in the bowels of the earth in the silence of meditation. And then today, the son is born again, December the 25th. And how is the son reborn? The sun is reborn between Sagittarius and Capricorn, between the horse and the goat. So where would the birth take place? In the stable. In the place of the horse and the goat, the stable. You know, it's very hard for people that live in the United States to understand the Eastern mind that writes these symbolic things. And that's why it's difficult even when we show people sometimes. But you're, you're, you're reading Eastern mythology and Eastern mysticism, and that's the way they operated. It says in Luke 2, 7, she brought forth her firstborn, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger. There, by the horse and the goat, the son is reborn on December the 25th between Sagittarius and Capricorn. The sun moves on. It continues its movement. And let me just take this out of here so we can use this from the bottom. 30 days after the birth on December the 25th, the sun moves into the sign of the water man, which is Aquarius. 30 years after the birth of the sun god, what happens? Go to page 778. Look at Matthew chapter 3. And look at verse 13. Then comes Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized. He enters into the water man, John. It's very... Right on the butt. There's not one thing that's missed. And after he leaves the water man, John, the sun in the sky leaves Aquarius. It moves on to the sign of the fish, Pisces. Go to Matthew, page 779. Go to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. Jesus leaves John, and then he comes upon these people, and he says to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. He moves on and selects the fishermen. The son has been born of a virgin. It has gone through the balance of the cross. It has gone through betrayal. 
It is crucified on December 21st. It is entombed in the winter solstice. It is reborn on December 25th. It enters the water man Aquarius. It moves into the sign Pisces. And everything is documented in the Bible step by step in the life of Jesus, the sun god. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And now comes this time that we will be anticipating because now we are going through the dark period. The sun has been reborn, yes, and it starts its movement upward. And watch every day. We say this every year, but watch every day. Every single day becomes a little less darkness. Why? Because the sun has been reborn. The sun is rising. The sun is ascending. This is the ascension. The sun is rising. See, you read about the ascension. And the ascension says that Jesus will rise and was taken up into the clouds to sit at the right hand of the Father. Certainly, because the sun rises out of the bowels of the earth of the winter solstice and then will move up to the highest point and sit in the northern hemisphere of the eastern sky or at the right side and bring a spring and bring a summer. And all the flowers will burst forth and life will be given new. Why? Because the son was born of a virgin, because the balance was reached, because he overcame the betrayal, because he submitted to the crucifixion, because he sat in the meditation of the solstice, because he entered the water man, because he selected that which was the fishers of men and then consumed that which is the lamb and sat at the right hand of the father. All of that happens by the sun in the sky. And that's why you have spring and summer coming on the heels of winter and fall. So it's, it's a scientific fact. See? So the sun now moves to Aries. And Aries is, Aries is the Lamb of God. When the sun moves into Aries, the winter is gone. And the ancient people would look at Aries and say, Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the cold of the winter and brings new life to our crops and to our animals. The Lamb. Look at page 16. Genesis chapter 22. Okay. Genesis chapter 22 and verse 7. And Isaac spoke to Abraham. He said, My father, here am I. Where is the lamb for a burnt offering? So you've got to have a burnt offering. If you don't have a burnt offering, God isn't happy. Do you know what we do? We were talking a little while ago about the, the physical. You know what people do all over the... There are even religions today which kill little animals. I, I mean, how, how can people think that taking a little baby goat and killing it is going to justify with some god on some planet somewhere for the scuzzy things that they've done all their life? But this is an easy way out, you know. Hey, I'm a scuzz, I'm a focaccia, I'll kill the goat. And I'll get off the hook. Where is the lamb for the burnt offering? It is Aries. So the sun consumes Aries. It becomes the lamb that takes away the cold of winter. And here comes the sun raising itself out of Pisces and enters into Aries. And look what it says in page 864, the Bible, the book of John, page 864, the book of John. John chapter 1. And look at verse 29. John sees Jesus and he says what? Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. So here, born of a virgin in September, finding the balance between physical and spiritual in Libra, betrayed by Judas Scorpio, crucified December the 21st on the cross, three days and three nights in the tomb in the bowels of the earth in the winter solstice, reborn December the 25th today, moving through the water man Aquarius, moving through the sign of the fish Pisces. And now, behold, enters the lamb. The burnt offering takes place. The fire consumes the lamb, Aries, and the sign and the statement is made, behold, the lamb of God. Certainly it's the sun god. The sun god. And so here then summertime comes. Now when the sun comes through the trajectory of the earth, rises up to Aries the Lamb. It then moves into the eastern hemisphere at the northern side, okay, sitting at the right hand, and summertime comes to the earth. That's what happens. That's an astronomical fact. I want you to read page 829. And on page 829, look at Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16 
and look at verse 19. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat at the right hand of God. The sun God. That's, that's what it is. It's astronomy, it's astrological, it's cosmological. And everything that happened in the life of Jesus is portrayed in the stars. And what does it say in the first page of the Bible about the stars? Let them be for signs. And it says, Isaiah says, Behold, the Lord will show you a sign, then you should look up in the stars. Folks, just stop for a minute. I know, you know, it's Christmas time, you're tired, you don't need to listen to me and all this kind of stuff. But just think for a minute what this is all about. You've got 50 billion people coming and listening to the story, and nobody knows this. Nobody knows this. And I have showed you step by step this is a fact. And it says in the Bible, and you read it on the first page of the Bible, it says God says that the stars will be for signs. You saw it. It says the stars will be for signs. You've read it yourself in the Bible. In Isaiah, it says the Lord will give you a sign. A virgin will conceive. Meaning all of this stuff is coming out. It's all written in the stars. And you saw it. And so after the sun leaves Aries, the Lamb of God, which is taken away, it moves into Taurus. Because prior to the myth of the Lamb of God, and we are saved by the blood of the Lamb, the myth of being saved was by the blood of the bull. And that was the ancient Mithra bull cult. And Mithra was born on December the 25th of a virgin. And Mithra was crucified for the sins of the people. And Mithra was laid in the tomb. And the priests of Mithra used to surround the tomb on the day of the spring equinox, which you know as Easter, and say, oh, rise up. You have saved our souls by giving your... And so forth and so on. And so we were saved by the blood of the bull. And that is the cult of the God known as El, of which the word Israel. Salvation in that cult was through the blood of the bull, and the bull sacrifice became very, very important. And you don't have to look at it now, but Exodus 29, verse 11, it says, You shall kill the bull before the Lord. This is Taurus in summer as the sacrifice in the same way that Aries is the sacrifice in the spring. And so now the sun moves away and moves into Gemini, which is the twins. And this is Jesus' movement within the 12 signs of the 12 disciples. Very, very important here. Look at Matthew chapter, look at page 789. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 49. And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold my mother and my brethren. He has reached Gemini. He has reached the point of the brethren, the brothers. After the sun leaves Gemini, the point of the brethren, it moves into Cancer. It's the time when vegetation begins to retreat back to the earth. And it is the time when Jesus sees the coming time of crucifixion. All oh, now the sun is, is getting ready. It has not peaked, but it's getting ready because it knows now it's starting to move back down to resume its trek again in this endless cycle. But before the sun is again born of a virgin, it enters in to the sign which is Leo. Leo, the lion. And when the sun enters the sign Leo, it has concluded its journey. And I would like you to look at a statement. Go to page 1005, look at Revelation chapter 5, verse 5. The sun has concluded its journey in the constellation Leo, and the statement is made in the book of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 5, verse 5, and one of the elders said, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. He has reached Leo. There is not one sign that is missed. There is not one movement of the sun through the zodiac that is not duplicated in this life. And in addition to that, let me tell you, that Jesus in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, refers to himself as the Amen, which is the name of the Egyptian sun god. I didn't plan that, but, I, you know, that's important for you. Go to page, just look at me, you know, for the sake of an extra two minutes. Revelation chapter 3, look at Revelation, I don't know what page it's on. Revelation chapter 3, can you find that? And look at verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things say the Amen. Amen is the name of the Egyptian sun god. 
So he's calling himself the Son. Not only is he duplicating the trajectory of the Son, not only does it say when he's crucified that the Son goes out, he calls himself the Son. Tell, somebody tell me what page in your little Bibles is Matthew chapter... Uh, what page is Matthew chapter... 2. Matthew chapter 2. What page is that on? Okay, go to page 778. Matthew chapter 2, verse 14. When he arose, meaning Joseph, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt and was there until the death of Herod that I might be fulfilled, which was spoken to the prophet, out of Egypt have I called my son. Who? Amen. The Egyptian sun god. Out of Egypt have I called my son, because they understand the myth of the sun god. You don't. And so out of Egypt has he called his son the sun god, so that you can understand this. See? You don't have to be able to read the Bible to understand this. You, you can look up at the stars, you can understand that which is the movement of the sons of the zodiac, then you understand which, which is the movement of the Savior. And I'll tell you something else, Jesus is known as the bridegroom because he said, I call himself the bridegroom, he says, hey, people don't, don't fast when the bridegroom is with them. Why did he call himself the bridegroom? Why did he call himself the bridegroom? I'll show you why he called himself the bridegroom. And I don't know what page this is on either. Somebody tell me what page Psalm 19 is on. Psalm 19, what page is that on in little Bibles? And we'll see why Jesus calls himself the bridegroom. 471. Okay, go to page 471, Psalm 19. Now Jesus refers to himself as the bridegroom. Look at Psalm chapter 19, verse 4. The line has gone out through the earth, their words to the end of the world. In them has he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of its chamber. Certainly he's the bridegroom. Certainly he's amen. Certainly he's the Egyptian sun god. Certainly he's born of a virgin. Certainly he's reached the balance of the cross. Certainly he's betrayed. Certainly he's crucified. Certainly he's in the winter solstice. Certainly he's born on December the 25th. Certainly he moves then into the water man Aquarius. Certainly he moves then into the sign of the fish Pisces. Certainly he becomes the lamb of God of Aries, sits at the right hand of the Father. Certainly the sacrifice of the bull is made in the ancient testament of the summer sacrifice. Certainly the gemini of the brothers of the twelve is made as he is companions with the twelve which are the disciples. And Certainly he moves into Leo and becomes king of kings, lord of lords, the lion of Judah. Certainly he's the sun god. What else can he be? And who knows that besides you? <laughs> Not too many people. <laughs> and then all the cycle begins again. And all of us must begin again and again to evolve to the point of the sun. Why and what is this all about? All of this is about this. The laws that govern the movement of the sun also govern that which moves within you. It is the same law. And inside of you, in this part of your body, is a place called the solar plexus. It is the sun. And once you find the balance in your life between the physical and the spiritual, then you will be betrayed. And then you allow the betrayal of the flesh so that you then become that which is totally endowed with spirit. Okay, you then submit to the cross of the crucifixion of the five senses, which is sight, taste, touch, smell, hearing in your meditation. You dwell in meditation in the solstice, and then you find a new birth. The child is born within you. And you enter into the water, man, because you raise yourself from the first level of consciousness, which is earth, which is earth to the second level of consciousness, which is water. And then you become that which is the fish, because you are consumed in that symbol, which is the Christ, that which is the God, which is the fish. And you mount that energy as it raises itself up to the brain to that which causes the pineal gland of the brain, pineal gland of the brain, which is Aries. When the solar plexus energy raises itself through those chakras and upwards and then touches Aries, which is the pineal gland, it throws open the right hemisphere of the brain and summertime comes to your life. That's why all of this goes on in the stars. That's why it goes on in the Bible. And that's why it goes on inside of you if you'll let it. The sun that sits at the right hemisphere brings new life to us all. So today, December the 25th, the sun is born. It has given its life upon the cross. It has endured the tomb of the winter solstice. Now it must enter into the water. It must consume that which is the fish and then consume that which is the lamb. 
And if we'll understand the journey of the Son and its life as our journey, then our life will certainly be culminated in a Christmas that is meaningful and in the birth of the child that is meaningful. Everything that is without is that which is within. Everything that is within is that which is without. It's called macrocosm and microcosm. And if you'll be true to yourself and think of what we've talked about today, and what we have documented not only in the Bible, but in the stars of the sky, you will see truly that this one who created these words said specifically he wanted the stars in the sky to be signs for you and that he gave you a sign as it says in Isaiah a virgin shall conceive and if you will look you will can trace this right back to the beginning and see the conception of the sun out of the sign Virgo in the month of September and follow the trajectory just as we've given it to you and then